Hey, everybody. Daniel here again with Robert Bashara, one of my uh, online buddies for many <laughs> years now. And now uh, first time we've been face to face, super excited to bring him onto the program, talking today about Islamophobia, uh, Muslim studies in the West and beyond, uh, a, you know, psychoanalysis, what Robert has actually uh, coined a new kind of area of study within psychoanalysis, decolonial psychoanalysis. We're going to talk about that and have a wide ranging conversation. As I think a lot of you know, I have a strong interest in uh, the field of critical Muslim studies. Islamophobia has been a big area of my own interventions, my own research. So I'm very and also also very much interested in Islam and psychoanalysis. So this is going to be a, a wide ranging conversation. I think folks are going to learn quite a lot here. Robert uh, has written an incredible translation of a, a, a Islamic scholar, a Muslim scholar. Is that is he is he Muslim or is he Christian Arab? Uh, he's a Christian Arab. Yeah, yeah. He's a philosopher. Yeah, he's a philosopher, Christian Arab, Murad Wahba. He wrote a book called Fundamentalism and Secularization, and this came out Robert in twenty twenty one. It just came out earlier this year. Very nice. Yeah. Robert, tell us, tell tell the, the viewers and listeners a little bit about yourself. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks, Daniel, for the invitation. And I want to add that we've been corresponding probably since 2016. Um, I think uh, as I started doing research, as I was in the middle of research on psychoanalysis, the war on terror, Islamophobia, and looking at you know, the connections between all three, I came across some of your articles and you were kind of one of the early uh, pioneers of writing on uh, Islam and psychoanalysis. So I wanted to give you a shout out for that. So, uh, but in terms of, yeah, go ahead. You wanted to say something. Thanks brother. No, thank you. For that. <laughs> uh, we, we will we'll chat about that. Appreciate that though. Yeah. I recognize you. So um, in terms of my background, so my background is actually not many people know that uh, I'm a fine artist first and academic second. So uh, my background is really in theater, music, and film. Um, you know, I was part of the underground uh, artistic movement in Cairo, and that's what I did for a long time. Uh, and then um, I turned to um, sort of uh, psychology around uh, 2012. And so that's when I did my PhD in psychology and... Uh, got more into psychoanalysis and qualitative research and critical psychology and all of that so um so yeah i have my academic life and i have my artistic life and you know my keyboard is right next to me for a reason <laughs> it's amazing and you also do film yeah so um independent filmmaker um you know i've been making i've i've uh, directed produced and written two uh, feature length films and many short films yeah great and so, you have a background in film too i do film yeah i do i do film actually on document mostly documentary but mm -hmm. i learned you know i I, get, I gained a trade sort of skill set in production so i know how to produce a film and know how to write a script and put all the pieces together in that regard and it's uh um, it's crazy it's uh it's good knowledge to have it's good i mean i part of me doesn't like film um, yeah. as this as a culture because it's mm. extremely um i mean it's extremely powerful medium but it's so tedious and boring um you know when you're on a film shoot for example it takes up 99 percent of your mental energy it's extremely and there's much like much to be said i mean yeah i i, I well, like i like a lot of aspects of film but it's mm. it's hard to get into the inner struck the inner world of film is extremely it's way more hierarchical than a religious organization yeah. Yeah. And in a way in a way it kind of has to be um but but I, I i respect um i respect what film can do as an artistic medium of expression for sure yeah yeah uh also for me the problem with f filmmaking is really that it's expensive like i enjoy theater and music more because it's much more affordable yeah uh, but actually one of your films i used uh when i was at, at the university of west georgia which i think uh i think is called american muslims fact versus fiction i yeah. think you produced that one and yeah yeah i did a workshop where we screened it and then had a conversation um around that film so interesting yeah 
So, yeah, so let's actually kick off this conversation, Robert, with an analysis of Islamophobia. You've written, I think your first book was on mm -hmm. kind of trying to push a new critical understanding of Islamophobia. And my first question is, Islamophobia is simply racism towards Muslims. Like, could we could we just call it that and sort of say, well, this is the form that racism takes when it comes to people being perceived as Muslim. Is that kind yeah. of what Islamophobia is for you? I, I don't see it necessarily that way. So, I mean, sometimes uh, scholars use the shorthand anti-Muslim racism to kind of simplify what it, what it is. I think it's more complex than that. And so in my work, I conceive of it more as um, the othering and oppression of conceptual Muslims. And so that's kind of a key theoretical argument here. And so a conceptual Muslim is uh, someone who is actually a Muslim or someone who is perceived to be Muslim looking. So that kind of umbrella term covers um, a lot of victims that experience Islamophobia who may not actually be Muslim. And so that's really what the phenomenon is about. It's not necessarily, obviously, uh, a lot of Muslims experience Islamophobia, but then also a lot of non-Muslims. I mean, if you remember after 9-11, one of the first victims was a Sikh. Um, so, so that's how Islamophobia works. It's it's more on this uh, level of uh, misperception, if you will. Yeah, and it actually was invented in before nine eleven as a as a term by the state, by the British state, um, in the think tank, the Runnymede Report um, invented it. And I was was interested because I feel like a lot of people think when they think of Islamophobia, they think about post nine eleven far right racism. But actually, right. but actually, the more uh, constant and more normalized version of Islamophobia is what Sabah Mahmoud would call institutionalized Islamophobia or liberal Islamophobia. And that actually is more interesting to me in a way, right, where it basically refers to the way in which, to use Sabah Mahmoud's formulation, that Muslims uh, can be included within networks of power and institutions, but on a disciplinary basis. Mm. Their inclusion is based on a dichotomy of good versus bad Muslim for which they must either directly or indirectly um, deny, or no, or rather take the side of being the good one. Yeah? So you, you can be a part of the, the liberal institutions and so on from State Department to business, corporate life, et cetera, but your inclusion there is Ha kind of comes at a at a price, and I wonder if you could talk about that. Uh, yeah, well, uh, what I want to mention here, so the Runnymede report, uh, I believe it was published in ninety seven, popularized the term. But I, I really, um, in my work, I, I did a genealogy of the of the term, the concept, and it, I, the earliest instance I, I found was the late nineteenth century, early twentieth century, and it was mostly in French uh, writings about uh, the you know, Muslim majority uh, countries. And um, other than that, I make a distinction between Islamophobia as a discourse and Islamophobia as a fantasy. And so in terms of a discourse, I trace it back to Ronald Reagan, really. So uh, uh, in terms of how it's been tied with um, the war on terror, that specific connection. So to kind of back up a little bit, specific my specific interest to this, because, um, you know, I was in Egypt, um, you know, I lived in Egypt. I was born in Cairo, lived in Egypt till I was 24, then immigrated to the U.S. So I was in Egypt when um, the war in Iraq started. And that war uh, had a big impact on my consciousness in terms of my political consciousness. And so um, when I thought about, like, the origin of my interest in this research topic, it starts there. But then another big point, which I write about in my uh, first book, um, Actually, when I was studying film, I did an MFA in film, and one time in uh, in the classroom, there was a screening of a short film that I was acting in, and I was actually uh, in the film. I'm speaking in French. It's kind of a fun film that's uh, referencing the French New Wave style of filmmaking, and I'm just reading quotes in French. and And someone in the class said, "Oh, wow, you look like a terrorist." Okay, so I was first of all like. I didn't know where the, this came from. I didn't understand the association. There's nothing in the film that's related to terrorism, right? And yet there was this association, and and the person thought it was funny. Uh, 
That's the disturbing part. So this was a classmate. Mm. And so I didn't really think about it deeply in the moment, but it took me years, especially after reading Fanon and you know reading about his experience on the train and the child that sort of interpolates him and positions him as, oh, you know, look, a Negro. And it felt like a similar moment to that. And um, I had to like think deeply about it. So what I was interested in really, uh, and what I found under theorized in the literature was the, the theoretical connection between the war on terror or terrorism discourse and Islamophobia. Like a lot of scholars assume that there's a connection, but they didn't really show what it is. And so that's why I had to get into uh, the discourse and look back at Reagan. So because a lot of people, as you mentioned, uh, tied to 9-11 and George Bush because he made it explicit with the war on terror. But Reagan really is the one that started the war on terror. And you can mm -hmm. go back to see uh, the origins of that. But that's one conversation. And then Islamophobia as a fantasy is much older. Mm -hmm. um, and I trace it back even to uh, the 15th century. Mm -hmm. And we can get into that if you want. Yeah. No, no, we should. You know, <clears throat> this brings out Orientalism by Said, and I want to talk about mm. the, the meaning of that text and the, that discourse. But even in the United States, like uh, you also have a kind of strange, exotic form of Islamophilia. For example, yeah. in the yeah. revolutionary American Revolutionary time, the founding fathers and so on, uh, are you aware that the most popular book amongst the kind of literate classes was a thousand and one nights, hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> and like there's a, a all of this like Barnum's Barnum and Bailey circus, you know, this iconic right. American, you know, and Thomas Jefferson editing the Quran and all of that. Right? Yeah, but like Barnum and Bailey's, uh, they used uh, Persian architecture, right? So there's this like, right. kind of long, strange history, and actually one of the first moments that American Islamophobia really sparks. I don't know if you're aware of this is when the U.S. government goes to war against the Mormons and the press refer mm -hmm. to the Mormons as the Turks of America mm. or the Mohammedans of America. Right, right, right. <laughs> this is a very strange uh, genealogy, especially yeah. of Ameri American Islamophobic discourse because, yeah, like it first starts as a the Muslim becomes an um, object of of pure um, irrational violence when you enter the war on terror, which occurs pre 9-11, right? It's kind of a post-Cold War thing. And then, then it evolves. And you know, I've been engaged with this work for quite a while. And um, it's interesting that part of its evolution and also involved, you know, the, the myth of the Islamophobia industry, because one of the very interesting things about Islamophobia in the West is that it's bankrolled by far-right institutions, neo-fascist groups, libertarian groups, etc. Some liberal as well. Um, and they create certain, you know, they create a lot of propaganda that at certain moments in recent history has been extremely successful, which we could, we could talk about that as well. Um, but you're more interested, Robert, in kind of understanding the subjective this is where the critical psychology and the psychoanalysis kind of comes into the picture. Because you, in your first yeah. book, you had, I liked how you combined Lacanian discourse theory with an analysis of the subjectivity of American Muslims. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and you actually did that by some quantitative research and interviews. Qualitative, yeah, qualitative. Sorry, qualitative, qualitative. Um, thank you for that distinction. It's been many years it's since important. I took yeah. class in grad school. Uh, I always mix those up, but anyways, so tell me about, about that. Like what, what drew you, I know you shared your personal experience that, that is helpful, Yeah. but what drew you to combining, um, Lacanian psychoanalysis, especially Lacan's discourse theory with, you know, with this understanding of the subjectivity of otherized Muslim people in the United States in particular? Yeah. Well, so my training, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a little bit is in uh, critical psychology, which is basically <clears throat> looking at mainstream Euro-American psychology critically and um, critiquing it using different theoretical resources. So psychoanalysis is one of those. Uh, it's not the only one. And you can do it from the perspective of phenomenology, feminism, Marxism, what have you. Uh, so there's that. And then um, 
uh, qualitative research is the other uh, piece of it. And so, you know, um, I've, I've worked with different qualitative research methods. Uh, discourse analysis um, is one that really attracted me in general. And within that, because that's a whole world on its own, there are so many subtypes of discourse analysis. And also I've actually uh, used different ones uh, before looking in discourse analysis. But um, coming across the work of Ian Parker, because, you know, I was engaging with him. He's a British critical psychologist and a Lacanian psychoanalyst uh, who had a big influence on me. Uh, and so reading um, his work on, Lacan he developed pretty much uh, Lacanian discourse analysis as a qualitative research method for critical psychology. Obviously, the basis of it is uh, Lacan's Seminar 17, wherein he talks about the four discourses and all of that. But what he did, what Parker did was try to, um, you know, flesh out the methodology further so that there's some kind of guideline of how to use it qualitatively and apply it to in terms of uh, analyzing interview transcripts. And so there's an empirical yeah. aspect to it. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, basically, um, it was very uh, attractive to me because, you know, I was already into discourse analysis. I understood, you know, the importance of language. Uh, and that's a big part of critiquing psychology is to, because, you know, mainstream psychology will reduce subjectivity to one of three things. It will be the brain, or the mind, but understood in terms of cognition um, or behavior. So those, that's basically the typical mainstream psychological approach. Uh, and so uh, critical approaches try to understand subjectivity in more complex ways. And one of the ways to do that is to kind of focus on language and discourse, right? Mm. And so that really appealed to me. And of course, uh, uh, it ties really well with the whole um, linguistic turn of the 20th century uh, and philosophy mm -hmm. and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, uh, it's still an appealing approach to me. Yeah. Um, the only uh, limitation um, that I find and where, where psychoanalysis had to be kind of emphasized a bit more uh, is this uh, focus on fantasy sp specifically, because a lot of times you focus so much on discourse um, uh, and then the fantasy dimension also has to kind of uh, be emphasized in the analysis. And mm -hmm. then later in my work, what I tried to focus more uh, on is the kind of materiality, the question of materiality in relation to, to language and, and subjectivity. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the evolution of my thinking on this. Yeah, and you have obviously Franz Fanon is uh, probably the, uh, well, he's an interlocutor that's extremely significant for you. Mm. Um, and I want to actually invite you to actually open up a bit of the Fanonian treasure chest of uh, ideas that that were we've been given by Fanon. I think there's been quite a lot of really compelling stuff that's looking at post-colonial slash decolonial studies that is kind of bridging uh, Lacanian psychoanalysis with Fanonian uh, insights. But Fanon's actually not the only figure that you uh, pull from. No. Um, Paolo Freire. Yeah. Uh, uh, Enrique Dussel is a very interesting figure to talk about here. There's many Absolutely. others, but let's let's uh, get our bearings straight with Franz Fanon, um, Black Skin, White Masks, Wretched of the Earth, and so on are widely read texts. Right. Uh, what what does Fanon uh, bring to the table for understanding this kind of racialized subjectivity that we're talking about here? What is what is Fanon's kind of contribution? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously there are different Fanons, right? I mean, the Fanon of Black Skin, White Mass is different from the Fanon of the Damned of the Earth, right? Um, the first one is more uh, psychoanalytic, existential, phenomenological. Um, and the second one is more Marxist, uh, more revolutionary, right? Both are equally important, uh, but in a way, they're two very different uh, Fanons different writing styles, different uh, theorization. Um, so the first one really, uh, the first Fanon really attracts me uh, because that's where I locate the beginning of what we can call decolonial psychoanalysis. And so, um, which is how to engage, and, and it's helpful here to talk about what that is, right? And so um, psychoanalysis is obviously a powerful tool. It's a powerful praxis. 
Um, it's a science of the unconscious. And so something that cannot be dismissed um, or canceled. Uh, but at the same time, it's something that can be critiqued and should be critiqued, especially from a non-European perspective, uh, mainly because non-European subjects were not included necessarily um, in the theorization of psychoanalytic texts uh, as you know, modern subjects. And so uh, that's, that's important to me that you know, because we're excluded, that doesn't mean that we should ignore the whole thing, but we should try to think about what is our relationship to it and where do we locate ourselves? And that's what he does with that text. I see him struggling. Um, you know, he's um, coming from Martinique. He's uh, in France. Um, you know, growing up in Martinique, even though it's a franchise colony of France, he did not experience the kind of racism that he experienced while he was in France, right? That's when he started actually realizing uh, what uh, racialization means, what it means to be black and all of that. So he's um, using the tools of the masters to analyze his experience while at the same time critiquing those tools. And that's basically what I see decolonial psychoanalysis doing. It's um, engaging with psychoanalysis seriously, using psychoanalytic thinking, but at the same time, there's this critical edge of what are the limitations here and how do we bring our own subjectivity and experiences to actually make psychoanalysis more worldly, in mm -hmm. a sense, uh, expanding it, stretching it. And he talks about that stretching. He talks about stretching Marxism. Uh, and there are similar critiques there, too, in, in the sense of thinking of Marxism beyond Eurocentrism, thinking of it in a worldly fashion. So mm -hmm. uh, that's really the move. Um, and that also is something that, you know, you mentioned Enrique Dussel. He, yeah. he frames that in terms of transmodernity. And so, you know, um, that whole modernity debate is a big one. Uh, and there are different critiques of it. Uh, he uh, thinks he basically rejects the sort of critical modern approach, which I guess best exemplified by the Frankfurt, Frankfurt schools, which is a critique from within. Mm. And he also critiques the postmodern kind of uh, dismissal of modernity. He thinks that both are problematic um, and both are ultimately Eurocentric. So they mm -hmm. don't really know how to critique modernity from without, from an exterior perspective, from the periphery, from the global south, right? Mm -hmm. And so the transmodern move, and this I think I see also what Fanon is doing, is to how to be, save what's worth saving from modernity. Well, at the same time, uh, adding to it, synthesizing with it things from without that were excluded by it. So that's the transmodern move. So really what it's canceling is the colonial aspect of modernity. That's the part that we want to throw away. Uh, and that's what I see Fanon doing and some of these other theorists that you mentioned. It's, you know, it's not against reason, it's not against modernity, but it's against this colonial logic that undergirds modernity that claims that modernity is let's say solely european at that or there's a, an equivalence between modernity and europeanness mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so fanon himself uh, was engaged in like you said the damned of the earth or wretched of the earth although that's probably a better translation to say damned of the earth i think i've i prefer it. that yeah <laughs> uh because in that in that text uh it was a kind of manifesto which mm. was extraordinarily influential in very concrete <clears throat> national uprising movements mm. during the cold war not only in africa not only in say algeria but way beyond that <clears throat> the third uh, world third world broadly speaking yeah so uh, time has passed globalization you know intensified finance capitalism Yet, uh, the global South, the third world, uh, remains in uh, much of much of the same um, material um, conditions. And uh, what I want to ask you is why use of was Fanon himself already at that time a decolonial theorist? Like what is what is the specificity historically of the mm -hmm. term decolonial? Why not? Uh, why do you not prefer to use post-colonial? Okay, that's a big debate. Um, well, I make a, a different distinction. So there's post-colonial in terms of post-colonial nation states after decolonization. So there's that historical term. Mm 
So basically, um, roughly around, around the end of World War II, all these nations that were actually franchise colonies, you know, uh, Egypt being one of them, you know, Egypt was colonized by the uh, the UK, and and then it became um, independent, so it became a post-colonial nation state, right? So there's that aspect, and that's an aspect that I critique, just because, uh, you know, the material decolonization is important, uh, uh, but it doesn't mean necessarily that it leads to liberation. That's the distinction that I make. Um, then there's post-colonialism as a field of study that reflects on those issues. And then there's decoloniality, which is really an effort uh, mostly from uh, Latin American uh, scholars who um, they see uh, post-colonial studies or post-colonialism as um, very academic uh, and not um, grounded enough in praxis. Uh, and so there's this split, uh, and the split, in a sense, is also, to some extent, and I write about this, ethnic. You have um, the post-colonial theorists mostly being from Africa and Asia, you know, the best representatives being Homi Baba, uh, Spivak, and Edward Said. And then you have the Latin American decolonial theorists, such as Enrique Dussel, Huerta Mignolo, Ramon Grosfogwal, etc., uh, so there's that. That doesn't really interest me as much, that kind of um, theoretical debate. Um, uh, what interests me is uh, decoloniality for me, it's connected to uh, liberation. And so uh, you can have de material decolonization and you can have a post-colonial nation state. And that's what we have in a lot of the global South. But we might still have uh, the most ugly parasitic capitalism right we might still have um uh, police brutality we might still have the worst kinds of oppression and violence right so that's why i don't see um yeah there's 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 a historical element to the post but it doesn't necessarily mean that the undoing of coloniality and colonialism uh the undoing of oppression and violence is there so that's the distinction for me so the so then this necessitates the development of mass politics politics of solidarity i know you talk i mean it's interesting because i think for a lot of people that are interested in first coming at these discourses they're going to ask well uh what is is this a sort of identity politics kind of thing and what's interesting robert and i want you to invite you to talk about this is uh, you have a very sophisticated reading of how identity plays into all of these dynamics. And you you talk, for example, about how even in Fanon's thought, the idea of non-identity is important. Mm -hmm. And actually, in a way, you're, you're sort of taking the category of identity so seriously and rigorously that you're sort of, you end up beyond it. And you also, for example, like to invoke uh, the important notion that Jody Dean develops of seeing one another in relation of the comrade yeah um so at this point can you address the identity piece which yeah. i think i think because you know there's a there's a geographical problem there which is in united states discourse it means something very very different yeah. than it does in these other milieus i mean if anyone that's an american let's say let's say you're a white american and you travel to what, what what they used to call third world or global south it's it's actually so uh different the dynamic the way you're treated like the way that like whiteness functions as a currency as a symbolic signifier is so different and so there's this kind of thing this maybe we could call the elephant in the room yeah and um say a few things about that please well for me well, as you mentioned, like I, I write about non-identity politics, which to me means uh, an identity based in politics as opposed to a politics based in identity. And so what that, that, what that means is uh, the problem of identity politics uh, is the problem of identification, which is the problem of any uh, attractive, seductive, uh, nationalist, uh, type of politics where there's a charismatic leader that we identify with. So that's for me the problem 
of identity politics is that we find someone that we think looks like us, represents us, and then we identify with this person. And then, I mean, look at all the historical examples where that goes wrong. So for me, and this is where psychoanalysis is helpful because, you know, obviously identification is always on an imaginary level, right? Uh, it's the realm of images. It's looking at others in, in that way. But what's more important, I think, politically speaking, is the question of desire and enjoyment. And so we have to ask ourselves as political subjects, what is it that we want collectively and what is it that we would enjoy collectively? And those are more important questions to me than the question of identification. Hmm. That's extremely helpful and very uh, radical. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, and that, that kind of is where Lacan comes in for you, right? With the, the emphasis on kind of politics ultimately has to do with the kind of subjective relation to enjoyment. And enjoyment is not to be understood purely as a kind of something that we find pleasurable, but as a kind of more, um, a more situated or broader way of life or, or sort of things of that nature. And so say a little bit more about that. How does, how does the Lacanian emphasis on fantasy, desire, enjoyment, et cetera, uh, how, how is that functioning here? Or yeah, how do you kind yeah. of make that case? Okay, I think one thing that's helpful, um, so in, in Freud and Said, I talk about the apparatus of uh, racial capitalism because that's pretty much like a Cartesian coordinate system that we're all uh, positioned by. So it's, uh, you know, imagine a Cartesian coordinate system like an X and Y axes and uh, basically we're interpolated in that hierarchical model to be somewhere in there. And so, uh, and so at the top of that, uh, I see sexual difference. And so um, sexual difference as um, in a way, uh, the regime um, that distinguishes, um, you know, masculine enjoyment from feminine enjoyment, which um, obviously, uh, historically speaking, favors the phallic enjoyment, right? And so, and that's why the feminist critiques uh, are important here to kind of question that and problematize that. And, you know, Lacan obviously was, uh, his intervention is helpful here in terms of um, mapping it this way so that we can think about what this feminine enjoyment entails, right? This uh, enjoyment of the other. And so there's that element. And my intervention is I see that this is, um, historically speaking, um, uh, an important structural differentiation, especially for European modernity. Uh, but it does not really account for the experiences of racialized, oppressed folks, especially non-European subjects. And so that's why I kind of introduced this notion of colonial difference. So a different, different uh, two other uh, modes of enjoyment um, and so there's, I, and here I kind of combine a little bit of Lacan with uh, Walter Benjamin. And so there's um, the mythic enjoyment uh, of coloniality, which is an enjoyment based in uh, violence and oppression, as far as I see it. And uh, you can see how it maps over racism and all forms of oppressions that we see. And then there's a possibility of another type of enjoyment, which is not explored as much, but it's there, which is what I would call divine enjoyment. Uh, uh, we can think of it as more connected with liberation and, uh, uh, and trying to think about a world. Um, and this is, I guess, with the notion of divine violence, which has so many interpretations. What that means, it's very open because some can interpret it as nonviolence or, um, or a kind of violence that's revolutionary, uh, but not in a typical way. Uh, <clears throat> so that's a whole other 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 thing. So, so I see um, what I'm what I'm hoping to, to see to see to see to see is that how can we all of us are situated within the apparatus of racial capitalism? No one is outside of it, right? There's no meta language, so all of our critiques are still from within. But what I try to 
do is just describe it in such a way that I include the experience of um, the racialized, the damned, the oppressed, and um, in relation to um, sexual difference, right? Mm -hmm. And so colonial difference is the difference between human and non-human, which is a distinction that obviously historically uh, played an important role in the development of race and racism and all of that. Yeah. Uh, right. And so we have to we have to also talk about that, not just uh, masculine, feminine enjoyment. <clears throat> so, yeah. So let's unpack some of this. This is very helpful. So there's a kind of mythic uh, structure of enjoyment, which you identify as coming from a, a kind of um, capitalist European um cultural source of sort of power and imposition. And and then there is, uh, you juxtapose that with uh, divine jouissance or divine enjoyment, which which you could say is a sort of both a way of, um, a way out of that problematic, but also a way of theorizing maybe a different kind of structure, structuring principles of enjoyment. That's really, that's really uh, fascinating. Let's, so, so, so how does, how does mythic enjoyment actually kind of impose? Like, what are the kind of coordinates of that uh, imposition? Uh, does that mean that, like, kind of what it, that, that it forces all subjects within the sphere of its apparatus and so on, that it forces all subjects to uh, abide by a certain way of enjoying and then creates prohibitions around deviations from that norm? Is it kind of like that? Or how do, how do you unpack this kind of myth yeah well the mythic enjoyment is the enjoyment that's made possible by you know colonization enslavement and all of its effects that we experience to this day and so i mean if you want to think about it in terms of a capitalist uh like an economic political economic analysis uh think about the kind of accumulation that allowed for the industrial revolution to happen right and the role of slavery in that and and so the kind of extraction that's based on this kind of very oppressive and violent enjoyment. So slavery can be abolished, but the mode doesn't change. It just finds other ways of extraction and you know surplus enjoyment and all of that. But it's all that's why we still struggle with racism in society. That's why we still all see all these forms of oppression because whether we are directly complicit or indirectly uh, benefiting from the system. It's a system that uh, its enjoyment is based on violence and oppression. And, you know, you see it in terms of wars, you see it in terms of all these modes of extraction. And and so, you know, we, we like to, to tell ourselves that we're more progressive, but this is just a, it's just a lie. Uh, we don't want to face a, this, this kind of very um, tragic form of enjoyment, right? Uh, and so obviously it's good to say it's important to say that it's not the only enjoyment out there and that's why i talk about this divine enjoyment which you know um if you think about the experience in the us uh the kind of aesthetics that um is produced from the african-american experience right uh with the spirituals and all forms of artistic expression and music and uh, in other ways um in spite of all the suffering and the struggle, how to sublimate that and turn it into some something yeah. aesthetic that's enjoyable in a different mode completely. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's very fascinating to me. I mean, I was I just wrote a book where I, I offered a critique of Deleuze and Guatri. Um, and you know, one of the things though that I will say about the way that they those two philosophers, both both kind of influenced by Lacan. One of the interesting ways that they spoke about racial subjectivity that would strike a little differently if they were to write about it today, which is that, you know, when they met, for example, with the Black Panthers, uh, mm -hmm. when it came to the United States on their tour, um, they often would refer to uh, their own solidarity with the Black struggle in ways which we would see today as a bit cringeworthy in the sense, <laughs> in the sense that uh, even for them, even though they're kind of white, heteronormative European men, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Those taboos didn't exist on their disc on the discourse, so they could actually speak about a kind of uh, 
minoritas or minor form of subjectivity, which mm -hmm. uh, they can have a solidarity with. So in yeah. a way, uh, they had their own revolutionary theory for how uh, anyone can inhabit that kind of uh, black radical subjectivity in a certain sense. Whereas today, I sense, Robert, and I wonder if you agree, that one of the challenges we're facing is actually how you might uh, foster a discourse where creative solidarities cross racial, cross class, cross ethnic, cross yeah. religious, et cetera, et cetera, can be done in such a way that you're not affirming liberal corporate identity politics right. on accident. Because I think right. that sometimes well-meaning people can actually end up with a discourse where actually what ends up effectively happening is a solidarity which can be co-opted yeah. by, by elites, by powerful institutions. And we've seen a lot of that. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit about those kinds of questions? Because, you know, w w racial capitalism is a real thing and it yep. requires an analysis of it. Yet at the same time, there's very elite forces, including the Federal Reserve and all the major corporations that can come in and kind of, yeah. you know, uh, take hold Go of it. and sell us back uh, some of those things. Yeah. And a lot of people are realizing that. So what do you what do you say to that? I mean, this is the million dollar question. Uh, so we're, given that we're, what we're dealing with is this apparatus of racial capitalism, obviously our solidarity, our praxis has to be uh, grounded in anti-racism and anti-capitalism. There is no other way. Um, um, one thing that inspires me about, you mentioned Paulo Freire and he's uh, a thinker that I really enjoy uh, engaging with. and. Um, so f for him, you know, like there are different models, obviously, of revolution, but for him, revolution, in a sense, is a, it's not something, it's not an event, it's a process, right? So it's always happening, and it can always happen, right? It's not just one event where here's the revolution, it happened, and then things have change after that. And we know from history as well that revolutions can happen things can improve a little bit, but then, you know, people hold power, you have state power, you have state capitalism, and then just recreating same modes of oppression and violence. And so I think we have to let go of that to some extent. I think that's a kind of, in my opinion, outdated uh, to try to um, think that, you know, just by putting the right people in power that things can be better. And that's a bit of the trap of identity politics is that we're looking for the leaders that will save us, right? Um, instead, I think we should, we should uh, you know, think of the practice of revolution on a daily basis in our relationships with one another and what we do and the ways we speak to one another and what we put out there in the world. Um, and then there's a long-term effect for that, you know? Um, now, of course, there will be critiques of coming saying, well, what about revolutionary violence and that kind of, you know, that's a whole big debate, right? Um, uh, I definitely, Walter Benjamin informs my thinking here, because when he talks about divine violence, he does give a very concrete uh, example of the, uh, the proletarian general strike as a form of divine violence. And I really like that. And so the kind of violence... And we can think about the Egyptian uprising of 2011 in this context. A lot of people like to think of the image of Tahrir Square because it's, you know, aesthetically appealing. But that's not really the, the key moment. The key moment was when workers went on strike behind the scenes and were not televised. And the whole state apparatus collapsed because of that. The, the, the cap, you know, the, the losses in terms of for the capitalists in terms of millions that led to the army to pressure Mubarak to step down because, you know, the state will collapse completely if the workers don't go to work. And yeah. so they were like, you have to step down, but that's not televised. That's not like the image that will be on Wikipedia. That's yeah. not what people will be talking about, but that's really where, that's really where the, you know, rubber hits the road. Yeah. No, it's almost like, the proletarian position needs to be 
10 times more adequate and more sophisticated in the way it speaks about racial capitalism than the liberal progressives and the elites are because they can speak about it too right but they they i want to actually read a quote from your book on freud and said where you say sure. uh we are not comrades because we are the same but because despite our differences we we may share common interests the paradox is that under racialized capitalism not only is violence normalized everything is individualized in contrast the subject of psychoanalysis with its singularity of being provides a necessary departure from both individualism and collectivism the subject of the unconscious is a psychosocial subject who transcends the particularities of filiative identifications into a pluriversal affirmative realm as such solidarity is not reducible to identity politics i like that a lot uh it's a nice thing and you're using here jody dean's concept of the comrade mm. uh with this subject of uh psychoanalysis this is why psychoanalysis is important and by the way related to this you know Freire uh, talks about the importance of dialogue for revolutionary praxis and he grounds dialogue uh in in love and he thinks of love as a revolutionary uh force and i do too uh and he distinguishes between dialogue and mere verbalism or chatter so for him you know words without action that's not dialogue and he's also saying that action without words he calls it activism is not praxis and so um uh, and this is very key for psychoanalysis because at the end of the day um uh, you know all we have is free association and free association is a beautiful phrase because it means um speaking freely but it also meaning freely associating with other comrades it has those both both meanings yeah, and and I so like yeah and that's very that's very crucial and that's that speaks to dialogue that speaks to love that speaks to comradeship yeah and and a lot of times that's not there a lot of times what you see on social media is uh very emotional debates and 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 uh and screaming and of course this works in favor of the elites because they want us divided mm -hmm. right exactly. they don't want us to be in solidarity yeah they don't want us to be in dialogue exactly. they don't want us to be in love yeah it's like the anti-identity politics chorus on the left can actually paradoxically just reproduce a more resentful form of identity politics so you have to treat these things there that like very carefully and uh very 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 well um and and show that in a way your commitment to liberation and emancipation is more serious than the people that are in power than they than they claim Absolutely. theirs is and um, you know another thing to add uh this is important also to mention because you know Freire writes about the oppressor oppressed relationship that dialectical relationship uh which not just the class thing it does have the class antagonism dimension but it also has uh, the dimension of sexual oppression. It also has the dimension of uh, racial oppression. So it's called all couched into that. Um, but his point is liberation is collective. It's a praxis. And it's truly collective in the sense that the, oppr the oppressors must be liberated as well. And that's important because sometimes uh, we, we, there's also a discourse of like killing the oppressors or, you know, F the oppressors. But like if we're dedicated to humanism, there are no exceptions. And yeah. I know that could be controversial because people will think of the exceptions. Yeah. But 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 the problem of the system that we have today, it's always based on the exception. It's like who is human and who's not human. Mm -hmm. So if we reject that, we can't have exceptions. Mm. And so it has to be the humanization of all. Yeah. I, I don't see another another way. I think it's reminds me of something that Eldridge Cleaver, one of the early Black Panthers said, he said that the the white industrial proletariat in America will become um, lumpenized, they'll become more lump, lumpen proletariat. And that he said that the black population um, can teach, uh, they can offer something because they've been uh, sub proletarian much longer. Hmm? Yeah. Um, 
And then in a way, like if you look at Clyde Barrow's new book on lumpen proletariat, which I highly recommend to everyone, we had Clyde on the on our okay. channel. Uh, he says, well, uh, Trumpism was kind of the coming home to roost of that prophet prophetic insight that Eldridge Cleaver had. Mm. But the problem is, is because we don't have any class consciousness, none of that, you know, disenfranchised white sub proletariat is going to see themselves that way. Uh, and that actually goes to racial capitalism itself, right? Because racial capitalism would harm the 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 sub proletarian white worker, or even worker slash non worker ejected from work, uh, because it would still allow them to use this kind of fantasy, they could relate to the fantasy yeah. of something uh, more material than they have available to them. Right. And that's a tragedy. That's a tragedy. That well, that's how whiteness was invented, right? I mean, yeah. it's, it's to, to fulfill that, to, to make sure there's no solidarity with, uh, with blacks and indigenous folks uh, so that uh, solidarity uh, is on the basis of uh, race as opposed to class, right? It's extremely masochistic. I mean, the, um, uh, the Free Soil Party and the Know Nothing Party that founded the Republican Party, that kind of combination there, I think in 18... 30s if 32 if i'm not mistaken uh was itself trying to offer a way out of poverty for disenfranchised white people through racism right through through uh right forging a solidarity with the bourgeois white uh industrial business class with the lower stratum of the white class saying we'll give you a leg up over the blacks yep. and that's that's, and the boys, uh, of course, explores that in Black Reconstruction. I mean, yeah, he, he does a beautiful job. It's enough. I mean, if you if you study enough Marxism, it's enough to to make you um, so angered in, yeah. in, in reality. Um, and I think we need to avoid those Marxists that say, "Well, we don't even need to talk about race or capitalism because it's all capitalism." Just well, not in its evolution. You know, not in its its evolution has been involved with this very specific racial strategy, and um, it's extremely disingenuous and masochistic, and um, has to be addressed. You know, head yeah. on. And uh, Anibal Kihano is helpful here because you know his model of the coloniality of power. Um, it it centers uh, the labor relations, but also how race was invented to manage populations. Uh, so that's that's important to. Can you re, have, can you uh, restate the name of that author? Uh, Anibal Quijano, Peruvian uh, theorist. So um, he has oh. he he has uh, important writings on um, modernity and coloniality, hmm. and um, and so yeah, for me, um, at the end of the day, it's we have to look at all forms of oppression, especially ones that produce uh, hierarchies that live on violence and oppression so that's mm -hmm. that's the bottom line mm -hmm. and that includes class struggles that includes sexual oppression that includes racism so we have to be mm -hmm. uh very clear that you know we're not going to prioritize one we have to be against all mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. no it's really really nice um so edward said uh is we miss edward said i mean it just yeah in the discourse you know in the in the pop in the kind of he was for folks that may be too young to remember i'm old yeah. enough to remember when he and chomsky and howard zinn would give these um public talks and lectures right. on u.s imperialism and you know israel palestine stuff and he had a moral conscience he had a um sophistication in the in literature which was global and cosmopolitan yeah. and he had an authority academic authority um even the the elites could not mess with him in no, a way no. in, in a certain way uh, right and he's also one of the most misunderstood figures but what do you mean by that well um he so so a lot of people reduce him to um orientalism typically to that text which is obviously an important text uh, so there's that, um, uh, th this kind of post-colonial reduction to that specific text and in a way uh, negating all of his uh, praxis and activism for the Palestinian struggle. Uh, I mean, he was uh, on the Palestinian National Council and 
he was engaged in that for years and worked directly with Yasser Arafat and and he left when you know just before the Oslo Accords. So uh, so that and then also um, I think a lot of Marxists um, just have a very um, uh, kind of stereotypical um, understanding of him as just someone that hates Marxism and sees it as Eurocentric and that's it. That's a, not a very nuanced uh, take. Uh, and at the same time, when, when I bring him into psychoanalytic circles, a lot of people just dismiss him as, oh, he's just Foucauldian. He's not really into psychoanalysis. So these are like common uh, misunderstandings. Uh, they don't know how, I mean, this, this man uh, pretty much was one of the key figures that introduced French theory to the United States. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, in the early 70s, he had key essays on, uh, you know, bringing in Derrida, Foucault, Lacan. Mm -hmm. yeah. And his second book, which is in a way his first major book, Beginnings, which I write about in Freud and Said, you see like a really um, um, uh, strong engagement with psychoanalysis, particularly the interpretation of dreams, you know, and, and Freud. And so, you know, uh, Orientalism was such a monumental text that it overshadowed almost everything he did before or after. Right. <laughs> That's so, a good point. Yeah. In other words, you don't need to read Said as dogmatically endorsing Foucauldianism or dogmatically uh, uh, having a position of a kind of I don't know, like an anti-Marxist anti anti -Marxist position. He's not. Yeah. Yeah. He's not. Yeah, and, and keep in mind, as a literary critic, you should remember, and I saw this in the new biography of Edward Said, did you know that uh, Lukács was actually uh, Edward's, one of Edward Said's heroes? Yeah, yeah. Hmm? And also, and something in that same book, um, on the Palestinian National Council, which had different parties, he was, um, his affiliation was with the more... Um, leftist revolutionary uh, element uh, in the Palestinian politics, the democratic yep. uh, front. So, I mean, the reality, the praxis speaks louder than any any arguments. And of course, he loved Gramsci too. I mean, sure. that's even clear in, in, um, in Orientalism, right? Yeah. And Orientalism spawned in a um, in industry, right? So yeah. in a way, he's not responsible for what it became. And that's actually a big, a big question with scholarship as such. Like I'm writing, I'm writing right. a book, I'm writing a book on Nietzsche right now, but in reality, I'm writing more a book on Nietzscheanism than right. Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. the, the effect. The effect. And can you, can you talk about how Edward Said was to give a lecture at the, um, uh, Freud Vienna society. And, uh, oh, yeah. they, they said, Nope, we're not going to have you give the lecture because, there's the image of you throwing this stone. That's funny, because that image is similar to like the Will Smith inf incident in a way. Um, like it's the know, iconic, iconic, iconic. Yeah, like one image that ends up being uh, super exaggerated it becomes a metaphor for everything, um, and right. that becomes violence as opposed to the actual violence that's happening behind the scenes, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, yeah, I mean, he was. Uh, oh, that's the uh, secret of Edward. Himself, <laughs> but that's the right. secret. He's, he's really a. Uh, uh so yeah, he really was a uh violence guy yeah he really was uh, yeah he was in uh he was in uh he was in lebanon i think and this was uh this picture i think the israeli embassy was abandoned uh and he was celebrating that and they were throwing rocks at the embassy but there was no one there <laughs> it's like throwing rocks at a building but like just the image and he said it was a pebble yeah yeah, it was, it was, I mean, that whole practice, I mean, think about it, like, you have um, the dispossession of Palestinian folks and, and uh, their towns and villages and, you know, their actual history of violence and tragedy. And then that one image of a person that's hated and, and you know, the political unconscious associated with terrorism just because of his identity, just throwing a pebble or a rock at an abandoned building that becomes the you know the 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 exemplification of violence so it was a stupid decision uh from the freud museum in vienna and honestly uh i did an event recently with the freud museum and the current president of the freud museum vienna 
was was uh, was very ashamed that this happened, and she apologized and on behalf of the museum, and they regret doing this. But you know, that's uh, you know, th worse things happen. You know, like the cancellation of a stock, but some people lose their careers over this stuff. Yeah. Said, let's talk about Said's ideas for a moment, because one in, in idea that you pull from him, and which is not really a Foucauldian idea, because he was a humanist. Right? Yeah. And yeah. Foucault's talking about death of man and death of the author. It's very different. Uh, so Said is, you know, the core of humanism is the secular notion that the historical world is made by men and women and not by God, and that it can be understood rationally. So yeah. Edward Said actually has a commitment to that tradition to the humanist tradition but in a in a critical way can you yeah can, and again that's not really Foucauldian so he's, no no he's a very complex he was he was struggling I think uh, what attracted to him about Foucault was the methodology I mean that's that's the bottom line and Foucault influenced a lot of people that way even Lacan I mean when I looked at uh, uh, the sort of uh, if you look at seminar 17 and the publication of archaeology of knowledge you'll understand how the the seminar is kind of in dialogue with that book right um, and so his notion of discourse is not something to be dismissed is obviously very influential and he's very good that way in terms of presenting a methodology but that doesn't mean that you have to accept his whole philosophy and I think that's what Said struggled with is that he liked the methodology of like looking at archives and doing discourse analysis but he also didn't like the idea that we're just going to look at discourses and subjects are mere effects of discourses that they have no agency he didn't like that and he's very clear about that. So that's why he's not a full-on Foucauldian. Um, he's a Foucauldian in that text with some reservation. And again, if you go to the previous text, beginnings, you see the strong engagement with psychoanalysis. And he prefers that theorization of subjectivity over the Foucauldian one. And that's why, uh, after Orientalism, he kind of abandons Foucault, never really cites him again. And when he does, he kind of, um, uh, he basically rejects him. So I, I showed that in the book that when he later is asked about Foucault, he's like, you know, uh, there's nothing really that was helpful for me in Foucault. I found much more helpful insights from Fanon and Cabral and others. Mm. Um, and so, again, people just reduced him to that one text. They didn't want us to see the evolution of his thinking and all of that. And of course, he wrote a sequel to, to Orientalism, which is Culture and Imperialism, which is a very different text. He does all the things that he was critiqued for in Orientalism. So he was critiqued that you did a really good analysis of how Europeans represent the Orient and you deconstructed that. But then what about how the Orientals represent themselves? Where is that? So that was the main critique of Orientalism. So he was like, his answer to that was culture and imperialism, hmm. right? That actually um, Orientals uh represent themselves uh, culturally and that that's a form of resistance and mm. it's connected very much to the actual resistance that's happening on the ground because mm. you, you definitely need the cultural element too um and the other thing too that i argue is that freud is repressed in orientalism um and that's a very interesting argument to think about because freud is mentioned three times in the text literally three references mm. Mm. however the shadow or the ghost of Freud is very strong in the text. So there's a whole uh, chapter called latent and manifest Orientalism. And yeah. you, you know, as, as, a, as someone that engages with psychoanalysis, you can already know where that's coming from, mm -hmm. right? The interpretation of dreams mm -hmm. is actually using. So the methodology of dream interpretation is there in Orientalism, but it's like in a ghostly fashion. Mm -hmm. So in a way, there's a tension in the text between the Foucauldian methodology, which is implicit, and this kind of unconscious analysis, which, which draws on Freud. And mm -hmm. in this way, his repression of Freud reaffirms his uh, sort of conviction that psychoanalysis is a better theory. Wow. So th yeah, so that's kind of yeah what I noticed, and I was like blown away by that. And let's talk about his intervention, his lecture called Freud and the Non-European. Sure. which was came towards the latter part of his life and it's a, a examination of moses and monotheism yeah uh, and some of the and actually the insights of moses and monotheism are extremely extremely significant especially yeah. as it pertains to this question we're having around identity absolutely um 
talk about talk about this lecture and its importance. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, it's uh, Said's last book, which is on Freud's last book, uh, and both men died of cancer, and so that's interesting to kind of think about that. He he t he uses it as an example of late style, which is a concept that he uses, and it's his uh, uh, actualization of late style with that with that text as well or talk because it's transcribed. Um, so Moses and monotheism uh, is a very interesting text because uh, uh, Freud argues that uh, Moses uh, was Egyptian and uh, that's kind of a very radical argument because that's basically making the the argument that you know um, the foundation of Jewish identity is non-Jewish which is my point about nine identity politics because identity politics in a way is essentialist like there's some kind of essence holding the identity but when you get to the bottom of it what's holding the identity is actually non-identity and that's that's a very radical point uh that freud is making there and uh and and said draws that out and fleshes it in in his uh talk to talk about obviously uh the israel palestine conflict and how uh, Freud's uh, theorization actually presents us with a, a path forward beyond this conflict when we actually don't think, and you know, as that these are clashes of uh, civilizations or something like that, like Huntington, but actually that when they realize that what they have in common is non-identity, then they probably will stop fighting, right? It's only when you say, I am this and you're that, and we're very separate and it's very concrete, but it's actually completely an illusion and a fantasy. That's mm -hmm. why the clash continues. It's a clash of fantasies, in other words. Mm -hmm. But uh, more sig um, also significantly, so he was writing this text and then the Nazi annexation of Austria happened as he was working on it. Right. Of course, he was very sick and all that. So he had to find a way to get to outside of Austria with his family and he ended up in england and then he wrote the second part of the the book from there so that whole disruption of the text by you know the the nazi annexation is also very interesting because it's the text where he addresses or thinks about anti-semitism in the most direct way i mean mm. it's you know he didn't really reflect a lot on his uh, jewish heritage uh so in a way it was kind of a repressed thing and then here he is directly facing it head on and thinking about anti-Semitism and all of that. So mm -hmm. it's very important for us today in terms of thinking about racism and all forms of oppression to, to look back at this text. It's urgent. It's an urgent mm. test. Mm. I, I really, really like that. And the, the book is also a theory. Moses and monotheism also discusses um, this idea that the religious community is founded on the murder of the primal father, um, but the the it's number one, and that this actually, according to Freud, uh, was repressed. So yeah. the, the horror of that founding act of the Jewish community was repressed. But in that repression, this I think is the interesting point. He says that the Jews uh, harnessed, and this is why repression is not to be understood necessarily as only negative. Yeah. Uh, but it, rather that they harnessed um, and uh, cultivated a sense of artistic and scientific advancement amongst the community, and that's yeah. what you by the latency of that of that repression that it kind of uh, has a certain creative tension in a certain sense. Yeah. And so the, very interesting point. And the other interesting point I really like about it is that the foundation of a community is founded by the stranger. Yeah. And of course, uh, Robert, it's interesting to to make a comparison, and I want to see what you think about this, to Fethi Ben Slama's argument yeah. that Islam is founded by Hajar, and that uh, Hajar is functions in a way as this the the other or the stranger to the foundation of the Islamic community. Yeah. Um so we, we can talk about that later. That's something I want yeah. to raise with you. Yeah, I mean, so what you said about the primordial father and all that. So obviously, Moses and monotheism is a sequel to Totem and Taboo, and he was writing it that way. Um, but uh, some things that we didn't mention, just to, to make sure that it's out there. 
so he makes the argument for it that there are two Moseses, not one. And that one is, uh, and so there's the Moses, the Egyptian Moses, uh, and there's another Moses that, that uh, in the Exodus that the Jews come across, uh, more like in the Arabian Peninsula. And uh, the two characters uh, had very different philosophies. So the Egyptian Moses was more influenced by Akhenaten and his monotheistic religion of Atenism, the worship of uh, one deity uh, represented by the sun's energy. So the, basically as the sun as the source of life, but not as an object. So there's that, and he says that um, that's really the foundation of monotheism and this idea of an abstract God, and that that's appealing because it's very intellectual pursuit uh, of mat, M-A-A-T, which in ancient Egypt means um, truth and justice. So it's like concept that combines those two in one. So he's really attracted to that part of the heritage, and the other part uh, the other Moses uh, rep like uh, worshipped uh, some kind of volcanic god uh, who's angry, like a volcano, right? And so basically the, the god that ends up being created is a combination of those two, kind of an intellectual uh, god, but also like a volcanic angry god. And uh, he's, he's trying to uh, resuscitate the intellectual one. And that's for him the, his, his point there. Um, uh, so that's the the one that was killed, in in a sense, um, I guess this ties in also to fundamentalism and secularization, in the sense that uh, the literal approach to religion uh, connects to the second version more, like the angry god, the kind of uh, um, anthropomorphic god, right? That's that looks like us, as opposed to the most uh, the more abstract. A version that represents something we can't personally relate to but represents certain concepts and you know the kind of god that's closer to philosophy if you will and psychoanalysis as an in, as intellectual pursuits right yeah thanks for that thanks for that distinction it's really really fascinating uh what what do you make of uh, ben slama's uh, he wrote a book called islam and the challenge of psychoanalysis and he wrote it kind of, and I've actually spoke with Nadia Bouali um, yeah. on, this, on this program about her opinion about Ben Slama's work. He's a Lacanian psychoanalyst. Um, he's very, very, very secular. He's French. Right. Uh, right. Um, he has the opinion that um, basically the fundamentalist subject of contemporary Muslim life, uh, and he really kind of blankets that, I think, a bit too, too, too much. Yeah, um, is a subject of perversion, but he also does this kind of exegetical analysis of the Quran and of the Islamic uh, holy scriptures, and locates the founder or the kind of the 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 stranger uh, at the foundation because again it is this principle of non-identity. Yeah, he locates that in the um, drama of Hajar, who was the uh, concubine of Sarah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if folks are familiar with that narrative from the Quran. Um, and then of course, um, you have the whole split there, um, with Isaac and Ishmael and, and the, the differences between how the Jews and the Christians read the Isaac Ishmael thing differently than the Muslims. Yeah. So there's, there's a, there's a whole narrative there, which we could probably, um, elucidate. But I want to. But my my question to you is sort of, what do you make of that psychoanalytic reading, you know, of the Islam origin story? Do you do you buy it? Do you think it's problematic? Um, yeah, I mean, it's not my approach. Uh, so what, what? What? You know, I I'm not an Islamic studies scholar, obviously. What I was interested in uh, in um, was to interview U.S. Muslims, and and explore their subjectivities through discourse and thinking psychoanalytically about what they're saying. So that's what I'm interested in, kind of grounding my thinking in something more empirical. And, and so a lot of my thinking is based in that. Um, and so I don't do, um, I don't use psychoanalysis to analyze Islam uh, personally. And, uh, uh, and so, for example, I think I mentioned this to you before, there was a, 
this uh, really important conference that I attended in 2017, organized by Ian Parker and Sabah Siddiqui. It was called uh, Islamic Psychoanalysis and Psychoanalytic Islam. This was in the spring of 2017 at the University of Manchester. And I presented there and I had to think, I was very attracted to the idea, like the relationship between Islam and psychoanalysis. And this was the first time that I saw it in confer conference format as a call for papers. So I thought about it and it's tempting to, to go that route of like using psychoanalysis to, to think about Islam and I'm not against it. But what I was more interested in concretely, and that's what I ended up writing about, um, is how psychoanalysis can help us think about Islamophobia and analyze it. And also ultimately to, to, to move beyond that, right? And so um, what I, and my entry point to that was kind of looking at if there were any psychoanalytic writings on that. And that's how I came across your work. I came across Zizek's work on uh, Islamophobia. I found it, uh, to be honest, you know, and I admire him, but I found it uh, um, sloppy and under theorized. And so, and he has writing on Islam's that are better than that, but uh, against the double blackmail, that book, which is not one of his best. Uh, but he he basically, his, his argument about Islamophobia was similar to the conservative right-wing angle. That Islamophobia is a term that limits free speech. Right? So every time that term comes up, that means that we can't talk about Islam or Muslims. And that's not what Islamophobia is. Islamophobia is about, the, as I mentioned, the othering and oppression of conceptual Muslims. Uh, so what's funny here is that term conceptual Muslim is actually inspired by Zizek because in the Plague of Fantasies, he talks about the conceptual Jew in his theorization of anti-Semitism. And he has a very, very strong um, writings there about fantasy. And uh, so I was surprised why he's good at analyzing anti-Semitism, but not Islamophobia yeah. when they're quite similar in many ways. And so that's really my project. Um, yeah. I, I don't want to talk about something. Um, yeah, no, that, that, that tracks. In. No, it's 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 been an interesting man. I'm not an Islamic studies scholar myself, although I have a strong interest in um, reading in that in that area. Although it's not my training, I'm much more personally trained in um, critical theory and colonial philosophy and Lacanian psychoanalysis. But but I, I will say this: I feel like it's. It's one of those things. So, so like take Freud. Freud is not a theologian uh, of the Talmud, right. but he's Jew he's Jewish. Okay, right. um, he can he can intervene there and say something from from the standpoint of you know the founder of psychoanalysis and from a psychoanalytic standpoint. And Ben Slama interests me because he's trying to kind of do something similar. Right. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, in reality, psychoanalysis in the Muslim world is. Uh, a real thing there's there's all kinds of clinics and and um analysts right and the culture is has been infused with psychoanalysis for decades yeah so i guess i'm just wondering like you know as a, as a theological intervention you know maybe in your analysis of muslim subjective life yeah uh maybe the way in which sacred narratives putting aside the exegetical question of like okay yeah let's let's examine because ben well, i can tell you what i found empirically from my interviews because that Please. might interest you so okay. one thing you know like this notion of code switching so there's that but something uh, much more significant happens so um you know in u.s muslim subjectivity in those interviews when i asked uh, the participants about their experiences and accounts of Islamophobia as well as how they resisted. So I was interested because, you know, I looked at the psychological literature and it was basically one quantitative mostly uh, coming from a kind of mainstream psychological perspective, but also uh, bring there's this notion of coping a lot, coping with Islamophobia as if it's something we should live with. You know what I mean? I didn't, I hated that term. I wanted to think more like, how do we resist it? I don't want to cope with Islamophobia. No one should, you know, but that's there in the actual uh, uh, academic literature. Another thing was a lot of the studies were interviewing uh, white folks and uh, seeing if they're Islamophobic or not. So basically the Muslim voice was absent. The Muslim subjectivity, the Muslim experience, right? And I don't want to speak for 
for U.S. Muslims. I wanted them, I wanted to interview them so that you can see them speaking for themselves. And that's what you see in Decolonial Psychoanalysis, that first book, is you see a lot of transcripts. And uh, some some people give me a really nice feedback after reading that, saying that reading those transcripts helped them listen better or listen differently. And so one of the things that were like stood out to me uh, was that code switching between uh, the U.S. Uh, identity and the Muslim subjectivity, right? Yeah. And so when they're thinking about themselves as U.S. citizens and talking from that perspective, they're internalizing the war on terror discourse and Islamophobia. Mm. When they switch to the Muslim subjectivity, they're very critical of that whole discourse and that whole fantasy. And so it's stronger than code switching. I, I see it almost as uh, a subjective uh, switch. Uh, and so uh, obviously when they switch to the Muslim subjectivity, Arabic becomes more prominent in the interviews. And so, you know, my ability to speak that as my first language was helpful. Mm. So I can transcribe that and think about it. And not mm -hmm. only do you get the Arabic, you also get concepts from Islam as well. Mm. So that's my engagement with it, like at that level, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which is the level of subjectivity. That, and that's, again, what I'm interested in. Yeah, I think it's I think it's really good. I think you, you maybe what would be needed in the future is something that could combine something more um, with more integrity than Ben Slima brings to the table, because I think Ben Slima's discourse is founded. Maybe we could say, Robert, in a kind of anti-Islam orientation in a way. Right. 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 But what would it look like if you had a really rigorous psychoanalytic uh, mm. commitment combined right. with combined with a rigorous theological understanding of the True. tradition? Mm? Right. As opposed to a dismissive approach. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I feel like that would be uh, quite interesting because, I mean, the other fig famous figure is uh, Mustafa Safon and he's Egyptian. Right. But, you know, I mean, I feel like his work is another example of something which is so um, militantly secularized, secular yeah. in orientation that it kind of and maybe this is an opportunity for you to speak about the book you recently translated. Yeah, absolutely. By Wahba. And how does how does that play out? Like, what is this? Um, what is this idea of fundamentalism? We don't hear it too much anymore. Yeah. Maybe we could start with breaking that down. It's yeah. a very, it's a very unfortunate framework um, to even, or, or, or rather it's just uh, too nebulous fundamentalism. Yeah. What, what do you? Well, uh, so that book um, was published in Arabic in 1995. And I was, when I was actually doing research for the paper I presented at that 2017 conference, that's when I came across uh, that book and I was reading it, translating excerpts from it. And, I was fascinated by Murad Wahba's theorization of the dialectical relationship between parasitic capitalism and all forms of fundamentalism, that you wouldn't have fundamentalism if you didn't have capitalism. Like he found a, that there's a theoretical link between the two. Um, and so he, that's really what he does. He, he does a genealogy of the concept and then shows how it works and uh, with capitalism and all of that uh, for him the key theorist of fundamentalism in his perspective is Edmund Burke, um, uh, the book on the French revolution where, uh, he's, he's being critical of it. And he's, you know, from a British perspective, worried that this could spread uh, into the UK and, you know, it would be problematic. Um, so in that sense, Wahba, uh, puts secularization on the side of revolution and puts fundamentalism on this side. So then, sorry. So then, Burke would be a fundamentalist of the fundamentalist persuasion. He thinks of him as a the a major theorist of fundamentalism. Yeah. Hmm. And so, so does, that, does that mean that fundamentalism is kind of synonymous with reactionary thought? Yeah, like conservatism. Um, so, so I think um, you know, if we think of like this kind of um, trifecta of like um, radicalism. Um, liberalism, conservatism. So he sees fundamentalism as a conservative phenomenon uh, that's supported by liberalism through capitalism. So basically he ties the two together in that way. Uh, and that radicalism or revolutionary thought 
uh, is more on the side of democracy and secularization. Um, so that's the distinction that he he draws. Um, he puts also postmodernism on the side of conservative, uh, the conservative side as well. Why? Uh, um, so basically, for him, fundamentalism like uh, is 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 a claim about uh, the absolute truth. So what it is and who has access to it. And um, he's a relativist from an epistemic perspective. And so uh, he doesn't deny that there might be absolute truth. It's just he has a problem with people claiming that they have access to it and then working from there. And so that's the basis for any kind of dogmatic approach. Uh, the other argument that he makes uh, that's kind of a cornerstone of fundamentalism is like a literalist approach. So any kind of literalist approach that doesn't allow for interpretation. So again, what appeals to me about psychoanalysis is basically that, you know, you can have multiple interpretations of any text, right? Uh, psychoanalysis will never uh, make the claim that there's one interpretation, right? Uh, whereas fundamentalists or dogmatists, and the, the two are the same for him, will make the claim that there is one single interpretation and that there is the literalist one. Um, so um, again, if you see the struggles today uh, that we have politically, you can also map it out in that way. Um, and um, another thing that he does that's really helpful, he traces the genealogy of what we call the alt-right today. So he, he, he's, he shows their origins in the new right in the 80s right uh jerry fowell and the moral majority movement uh and people forget about that but you wouldn't have the alt-right if you didn't have the new right in the 80s right so and of course what we see with trump is repeating a lot of reagan's discourses to the extent that he's repeating the actual campaign slogan uh reagan said let's make america great uh and <laughs> trump didn't come up with a new idea he just repeated that you know it's just a, a worse version of reagan or like a cheap version of reagan Right, so uh, so that's really uh, a key point of analysis for him uh, during the Cold War, uh, thinking about that and the, uh, the rise of the right in that context. Uh, another thing that I link in his work, I don't know if you, you like Adam Curtis, so you probably saw The Power of Nightmares. Yeah. Uh, that's a powerful movie that in a way uh, echoes a lot of Wahhabist arguments because in the movie, uh, Curtis shows that um, uh, Muslim fundamentalists uh, and uh, new conservatives have a lot in common, and that basically um, they have a, like this very interesting organic dialectical relationship. And that's exactly what Wahaba is saying: is that while they might seem like they're fighting, but they're actually believing in the same thing. Mm. Their mm -hmm. vision of the world is similar. It's the vision of this right nightmarish world uh, based on this fundamentalist perspective. Mm. Uh, and that's why well, we're kind of like caught up in that, th that, yeah. that whole class, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, we got to uh, respect your time and, and bring this to a close. But I want to ask you one thing on this piece, which is you and I both admire the work of Salman Sayyid and yeah. you know, critical Muslim studies. And he's a very creative scholar, um, written some incredible books. Well, Sayyid, as you know, Robert, actually reads Islamism quite differently than most people do. He doesn't really see Islamism as a epistemic problem, as a fundamentalist. It's not really of the issue for him. Actually, he sees no. Islamism as a response to what he calls the collapse of the Western logo, logos, like Western, what he calls Westernese. And it's kind of, um, therefore, a kind of political epist epistemological uh, counterweight to this kind of um, fraying kind of uh, global hegemony of the Western uh, discourse is, is, is waning and Islamism is a kind of rival to that, but it has in a way a kind of emancipatory kind of dimension to it. So mm -hmm. he, so could you juxtapose Sayed and Wahba's vision there for a moment. Okay. Well, Wahba, first of all, does not single out Islam, and it's important to point that out. So when he talks about fundamentalism, he looks at religious fundamentalisms in general, but he also thinks about any kind of fundamentalism. So you can think of scientific fundamentalism. Uh, it doesn't have to be religious necessarily. Uh, for him, really, the bottom line is 
if you think you have access to the absolute truth, and that could be a scientist or it could be a religious person. Uh, once you believe that and you act upon that, then you're being dogmatic and everything that you do will probably be <laughs> not good uh, because you really believe you have access to the absolute truth. Um, so uh, for him, uh, a key figure uh, is in Islam is Ibn Rushd uh, for Wahba. Uh, uh, he thinks, uh, he talks about him as a bridge uh, between, you know, uh, let's say the West uh, and, you know, um, the Orient or the global North and the global South, however you want to put it. And so he's a theoretical bridge in the sense that, um, you know, about the Latin Averroists, uh, you know, they, there was a whole school of thought uh, based on that. And so what he likes about Ibn Rushd is his humanism, his emphasis on interpretation, kind of like um, hermeneutics, in, in relation to the Quranic text. Um, so, and that's why he was, he ended up being rejected because the whole debate uh, at that point was how do we approach the text, right? Uh, is it open to interpretation? Um, and that was his argument, or we should be literal uh, about it. And that's ultimately the argument that won. And so he's for kind of a revival, his school of thought, Wahhabi's school of thought is reviving that kind of line that has been repressed in the history. Mm. So it's still something that's uh, indigenous to Islam. It's not something from outside, but mm. it's it's been repressed and um, hasn't been really, uh, you know, we didn't see its potential fully uh, actualize itself. I see. So then Syed's uh, positive interpretation of the Islamist subject and so on, it, could that be made compatible with Wahba, or is there is that kind of uh, not possible in a way? That's a good question. I think it's the question of uh, the connection between uh, the religion and politics, right? Yeah. Um, uh, I think uh, for Wahba, he would reject uh, uh, a politics that is theological. Any mm. politics. So, so that mm. would be a, a major point of disagreement between them. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I just want to say for folks interested in contemporary Muslim um, political dynamics, I, I, I literally can't recommend someone's side's work enough. I just really find it valuable, um, in part because he comes from a very sincere and engaged position himself. Right. Um, and he studied with Laclau, so he also brings some of that. Um, that's right. Right. Yeah, that's right. I would it would be amazing to bring him onto our program. Maybe, maybe in some future, maybe we will in the future. Um, Robert, I want to thanks. Thank you for, for coming on. I think there's only one final thing I want to ask you as we wrap sure. up here. Uh, talk a little bit about as a musician, you have this notion of the contrapunto, uh, oh, yeah. thing, which I think actually comes from Edward Said as well, because yeah. Edward Said is a music theorist as yeah. well. And he was uh, a pianist as well. I'm pianist. Okay. Yeah. Um, what is that exactly? This, this idea and you call it contrapuntal praxis. So it's an interesting term. Can you, can you break it down for us? Yeah. I mean, so in music theory, counterpoint is when you have two separate melodies playing at the same time. So obviously um, it creates some kind of tension that could result in uh, harmony or dissonance uh, or interesting polyrhythms, right? Um, so the way uh, Said uses it is kind of as a metaphor uh, in terms of uh, reading texts. Um, let's say uh, the example that he uses is if you're reading, let's say, a text by, let's say, a British author in the 19th century, uh, how is that text repressing what's going on in the world at that time? Right? Is 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 there any indication of let's say colonialism in that text? So he he goes into the example of well, some of these characters own a plantation. They don't really explore uh, colonialism, but the fact that they own a plantation and that's there. Uh, so reading it contrapuntally is so there's that reading of what's actually going on in the text, but what's what's kind of repressed in the text, but what's going on in the world at that time, fleshing that out. And that would be the counterpoint to it. 
And so that brings in the kind of the periphery, uh, right? Trying to see this text from the exterior. Uh, and that's really important to, uh, to what I do in terms of, you know, looking at psychoanalysis in a, in a sense from inside, but also from outside. Mm -hmm. So it's a method of interpretation, it's a method of reading in a yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. It's a, it's a beautiful concept. Yeah. Well, this has been a rich exchange and really deep dialogue that I'm grateful for having with you, Robert. And I want to yeah. do it. I want to do it again. I appreciate you for inviting me. It's a, uh, it's been a lot of fun to have this exchange and let's stay in touch. I'll, I'll link to the various works of Robert in the show notes. Is there anything you'd like to share with us regarding what you have um, cooking right now in terms of your research and your writing? Yeah, there's a lot going on. There are some things I don't want to talk about, but uh, I'm I finished a book. Um, uh, it's like I'm about to send it to the publisher. Mm. Um, it's gonna be uh, open access, which is the first uh, open access book I write. So it will be available for free. Uh, I can mention who uh, the publisher is. It's Punctum Books, uh, and so it will be available uh, to download for free. But mm -hmm. people can purchase a hard copy. Uh, I'll say that it's a psychoanalytic uh, engagement with um, um, a key cultural figure in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep it very vague, uh, uh, but I'm very excited about it. Um, uh, I really enjoyed uh, writing it. And um, so that's finished. I have, um, I'm working on another book on film theory, uh, mm -hmm. looking at the work of Yusuf Shaheen. Uh, I think actually you saw, uh, I think we talked about this. You saw his film, uh, Destiny, Le Destin. Mm -hmm. um, um, so, mm. so, which is on Ibn Rushd, right? Uh, That's right. That's right. right. So he's an Egyptian filmmaker that I admire. That's so amazing. I'm, I'm working on a book on him. Um, those are like really the two, two big wow. projects for this year. Well, we got to have you back to talk about this mysterious book. I know. <laughs> That's amazing. Robert, I'll announce it soon. We wish you the best and stay in touch with us. And uh, we'll have you we'll have you back for sure in the future, my friend. Thank you, Daniel. All the best. Peace out, everybody.